oh, I get it. Um, it is more important to build our strength rather than to make make us bigger in order to uh, increase our longevity. Okay. Exactly. Now, exactly. Uh, how does the amount of intensity of exercise affect our mitochondrial quality and function? So for mitochondria, so we were talking there about strength components. That's where we're looking at how much of the muscle proteins that, that we have. Like if you think about a steak, all of the things in the steak, all of that red meat in that steak, that's the muscle protein that's going to help us produce force. When we're thinking about mitochondria, that's not that big size or any of that. It's all of the little things that are producing energy. So intensity is going to be, it's, it can be, for mitochondria, it's, it's one of those things where you can do, you can build mitochondria in two ways. You can go at a low intensity for a long period of time. And that'll help you build mitochondria and make you, you'll make new mitochondria. And then the other way to do it is you can go really hard and, and fast and just go for a short period of time. So in that case, what you do is you go for say 30 seconds, as hard as you can. And then you take a little bit of a break, two, four minutes, something like that. And then you can do another 30 second sprint. Usually these experiments are done on a bike because you don't have that impact force of hitting the ground. When you hit the ground, if you're running, if you're sprinting really fast, as you go faster and faster, there's a greater mechanical impact force. And that can be hard for our bodies to deal with because that causes some, that can has the potential to cause damage. But if we're gonna cycle or if we're gonna swim or if we're gonna do an elliptical trainer, or if we're going to do something else where we don't have to use our body, where we're not impacting the ground with our body weight, then you can do long and slow or short and fast. Both are very effective at building mitochondria. And really what we want to do is we want to do both. We want to do the majority of the, our work slow and relatively easy at a pace. So if I'm running along, I want to be able to have a conversation. So the way that we're having a conversation now, I want to be going along for most of the work that I'm going to do. And I'm going to be able to have that conversation. But then for a few, maybe a couple of times a week, we want to go fast. We want to practice going fast. That challenges our muscles in a different way. And by just doing those 30 second bursts of activity, we're going to get a different type of stimulus that is going to help us increase our mitochondria even more. And I understand that like this, both the fast and intense sports and um, the wild sports that um, enjoy a long duration can both affect our mitochondrial quality and function. Absolutely. Yeah. Then... Maybe let's dive into some um, mechanisms with the molecules. How does the exercise activate our mTOR C1 in different tissues like a fat, liver, and brain to make us stronger and healthier? Yeah. So this is this is one of the cool things that happens. So so there's different mechanisms that are going to be important for the mitochondrial component. And there, what we want if we're trying to build mitochondria. We want this gene PGC1 alpha, which is again, it's just letters. But what it does is it can it helps to make all of the all of the genes you need to make mitochondria, to make blood vessels, and all of these things. And the way that we activate it with our exercise is either short and fast. We exercise faster than we can produce energy, and that activates this protein called AMP kinase, and that gives us more PGC1 alpha. When we go slow and easy, but for a long time, every time we contract the muscle, we release calcium. That activates this protein kinase called CAM kinase, calcium activated kinase. That can also increase PGC1 alpha. So in that way, we get the PGC1 alpha that gives us more mitochondria. But in our muscles, we don't want to just build up mitochondria. We actually want to get rid of the ones that don't work so well. And the way that we do that is when we do endurance exercise, it's kind of odd, but when we do endurance exercise, this protein that you talked about, mTORC1, it actually gets inhibited by the endurance exercise. And that's important because what it does is it allows us to go through what's called mitophagy. And mitophagy is the breakdown of mitochondria that aren't working very well. 
So when we do endurance exercise in the muscles we're exercising, by doing endurance, we decrease mTOR activity and increase PGC1 activity. What that does is that increases mitochondrial breakdown and increases the production of new mitochondria. So that's a really cool thing that happens. But then as we look at other tissues, mTOR is really important for a lot of things. So one of the things that it does is it regulates the size of the muscle. So if we did a different type of exercise and we did our, our weight lifting and we lifted that heavy weight, we went to failure and now the muscle is going to get bigger. Now mTOR within our muscle is going to get turned on and that increase of act mTOR activity is going to help us make more muscle proteins. But while we're exercising, it's not just our muscles that are affected. mTOR activity in the liver when we're doing endurance exercise or strength exercise, because the liver is really important for producing um, carbohydrate to help us, or sugars to help us power our muscle, power the exercise. What happens in the liver is that mTOR activity is decreased. What happens in our fat cells is decreased. In our brain, it's actually increased. So you can do the same exercise and look at different tissues. And what we're doing is we're turning mTOR on in some and off in others. And it really has this ability to coordinate a lot of these things. And the interesting thing, the, one of the more interesting things about the longevity side of things is that what the best known longevity drug is a drug called rapamycin. And rapamycin is an inhibitor of mTOR complex one. So what we think is happening when we exercise, we either turn on or off mTOR in our muscles, but in the rest of our body, we're turning mTOR complex one off in most of the rest of the body. And the baseline mTOR activity goes down just like when we take rapamycin. So the, one of the ways that we're increasing longevity with exercise is the same way that we're doing it with rapamycin or the same way we're doing it with specialized diets that are designed to decrease the activity of, of mTOR complex one. So overall in our whole body, when we exercise, the general thing is our muscles. We can either turn on or off mTOR, depending on whether it's endurance or strength, but in the rest of our body, especially in our liver, our GI system, our immune system, we're turning mTOR complex one off. And what that's doing is that's giving us that effect that we see with rapamycin, which is turning off mTOR in those, in those tissues. What that's going to do is that's going to decrease insulin resistance. That's going to decrease inflammation. That's going to decrease a lot of the things that are associated with, a, with poor aging. And just now you have introduced us via some molecular mechanisms and uh, some theoretical things about building muscle and doing exercises. Then shall we dive into the diet? I mean, which kind of diet has the most syner synergistic effect with exercise or how does diet affect our muscle growth and longevity? Yeah, so it's a great question. And and there's no, again, there's no perfect diet that anybody knows about. Um, if we're looking at a diet that's going to help us to promote longevity, the work that we've been doing is mostly around, um, a, a, again, diets that decrease mTOR complex one activity. So there's a guy down at uh, the University of Southern California called Longo, who's, who's studied diets that are low in protein. And those increase longevity in mice. We've studied diets that are low in carbohydrate. Those increase longevity in mice. Our, the diet that we look at is, is a ketogenic diet, which is very low in carbohydrate. It's high in fat. And in, in rodents, what you have to do is you have to decrease the protein a little bit, just so that because they're so good at making sugar out of, out of protein or amino acids, that you have to decrease the protein a little bit. But in a human, a ketogenic diet is, is you can have, you know, decent amounts of protein, healthy fats, and then, and then basically low carbohydrate. The reason that we look at this is because in, in the first study that we published, mice on a ketogenic diet that were meal fed, they were 10% caloric restricted. So they're really, really healthy mice. Our control mice lived longer than anybody's control mice do, but we still saw a 13% increase in longevity on a ketogenic diet. And when we looked at the muscles, they had better endurance, they had better strength at 26 months of age. So that's an old 
animal. So they have better endurance, better strength, and their muscles were bigger. They actually maintain their muscle mass from, from 12 months to 26 months instead of the controls where they lost muscle mass. So if we're trying to, if we're trying to have a, a diet that promotes longevity and works together with exercise, the ketogenic diet is, is a good option. The other option would be something like a low protein diet. It might have problems in humans because again, the protein's important for, for maintaining our muscle mass and our strength. So, so if we're looking at it, I would say that the best one to, to really synergize with the exercise might be a ketogenic diet. And the ketogenic diets will not do good to, maybe not do good to our athletes, right? Yeah, exactly. It's not going to be something that we would do with an athlete, though a lot of athletes have done it. So, and, and the reason that we say it's not good for an athlete is because athletes need to go really fast. They need to go, they need to be able to sprint. And the thing that happens on a ketogenic diet is that we don't have as much carbohydrate as we know because you've got, we've taken the carbohydrate out of the diet. And so what our body does is it gets rid of a lot of the glycogen in our muscles, the sugar in our muscles, and it uses fat as a fuel. And the way that it does that is it starts changing because our mitochondria can either use fat or carbohydrate. They make a choice as to which one they use. When there's a lot of fat around, our bodies adapt to promote fat and inhibit carbohydrate from getting into the mitochondria. So there's a there's a wonderful physiologist named Trent Stellenworth um, who's up in Canada. And what he showed is that when you're on a high fat, low carbohydrate diet, the way that your body promotes fats getting in and not carbohydrate getting in is by regulating a protein that's important for transporting um, pyruvate into the mitochondria and it's called pyruvate dehydrogenase and when you sprint as hard as you can pyruvate dehydrogenase needs to work as fast as possible to get sugars into the mitochondria what happens on a ketogenic or a high fat low carbohydrate diet is that that's prevented that protein is regulated by phosphorylation and it, it becomes phosphorylated and that inhibits it so that more fat more energies or more fat gets into the mitochondria. The reason that that's problematic is it takes us more oxygen to break down fats than it does to break down carbohydrate, which all of you who have done exercise would realize because you have to breathe a lot harder. And as we breathe a lot harder to provide more oxygen to the muscle because it has to produce energy from fat, which takes more oxygen, it's less efficient. And that means that we're breathing a lot harder. We're feeling like it's a lot harder and we tend to slow down earlier. It we are just less- It our acquirements of energy. Yeah, it affects how we generate energy, yeah. And so there's a very famous basketball player who, who did a low fat, carbo, um, low, a high fat, low carbohydrate diet. Um, he's, he's LeBron James. It was very well known that he was doing this. He became really sculpted because you lose weight on a ketogenic diet or a low fat or, or low carbohydrate diet. So he became really, he became really muscular and everybody, wow, he looks great. But then everybody's like, wow, he's slow. He's lost a step. There was maybe four years ago now. And he was, everybody said, oh man, he's old. He's gotten too old. He's not going to be any good anymore. And then he just went away. And for a couple of weeks, he, you know, he sat out, he stopped his, keto, his ketogenic diet, went back to eating carbohydrates. And then within two weeks to a month, he's back to the same explosiveness. He's back to being fast again. And that's wonderful for his performance because now he can sprint faster again. For most athletes, they need to have a period of time where they sprint. That's going to be prevented if you're on a low carbohydrate diet. Thank <laughs> you.